Hey, so uh, I don't say this very often, but let's let Jonas and the praise team know how much we appreciate them today. We appreciate all of all of their hard work, and uh, and not only that, but let's give out. There's so many people that minister behind the scenes around here that you might not know. So uh, I want to do a shout out to Jonas and our sound team. Uh, not Jonas, Evan and our sound team up there as well. And so. Uh, we appreciate them, and so, and then whether you know it or not, there are people behind the scenes ministering with our children's ministry and with our Spanish ministry, and all of that is going on simultaneously here, so we appreciate so very much the faithful people who are ministering uh, to make this ministry function, the people in the parking lot, and all of those different things, so we appreciate them uh, so very much. I'm glad you're here today. You can tell a little bit it's in the middle of July, so we have a lot of people that are gone a lot of people on vacation, but I'm glad that you're here. And I want to encourage you that during the summer, if you're in town, be in church. I understand we're all going to vacation, we're all going to take that time away, and we want to encourage you to do so. But if you're in town, let me encourage you to be faithful, and let me encourage you to be in church. So take your Bibles with me today and turn to Matthew chapter 6. I would also say that we have several families that are here for the very first time today. And so if this is your first time at Hollywood Community Church, welcome. We are so glad that you are here. And if you, if you're a faithful member and attender of HCC, if you see somebody around you that you don't know, please reach out, make them feel welcome, and let them know how thrilled that you are that they're worshiping with us today. So many years ago, when Vicki and I were young, we moved to Mexico as missionaries. We've, We've told that story many times. But I remember when we moved to uh, Mexico City, even we lived for the first year in a, in a town called Querétaro and then moved down to the Mexico City. I remember when we first moved there, it was difficult for us to sleep at night because of all of the noises outside. Do you remember that, Vicky? So, so, so obviously we didn't have air conditioning and it was a little warm. And so outside, there were just like, it seemed like there were more dogs than people. And so uh, there were dogs barking all the time. There were street vendors who it seemed like even late into the night would be walking down the streets and they would be selling their products. There was one gentleman that went down our streets all the time and he would yell out, tamales, calientito, tamales, just, you, you, know, you know, hot tamales. And so, I mean, all of that is exciting until you want to sleep. And when you want to sleep, all of those noises outside, our houses were really close together and it seemed like every weekend somebody would have a huge party and uh, the party would go way into the night. And I'm like, don't these neighbors know that I got to get up early on Sunday morning and speak on Sunday morning? And then after all of that, you'd finally fall asleep. And about 3.30 in the morning, the roosters would start crowing. <laughs> and the roosters would wake us up. It didn't take us long, though, to adapt to those surroundings. It really didn't. It's amazing how quickly you adapt. And after a few weeks... We were able to sleep, and none of those noises bothered us. As a matter of fact, it was humorous because our parents would come to visit us, and they would wake up in the morning, and they would be all sleepy-eyed, and they would say, man, I couldn't sleep last night, and we're, how come? And they say, because all of the commotion outside. And we would say, what commotion? What are you talking about? And they would say, why, the barking dogs, and the street vendors, and the roosters, all of that. We didn't notice it anymore. That which had previously disturbed us was now normal. So normal that we no longer heard it. I believe that same principle is true for the passage of Scripture that we're going to look at today. We're going to look at a very, very familiar passage of Scripture. We're going to study the Lord's Prayer this morning out of Matthew chapter 6. And, I, and I'm afraid, bear with me, I'm afraid that the Lord's Prayer has become so familiar to us that it no longer speaks to us. I would venture to say that many of us can recite it, and we're going to do that together in just a few moments. We recite it, we know it by heart, we've quoted it over and over and over again, And so it's become normal to us in the way that it no longer speaks to us as God intends for it to speak 
to us. So today I want us to begin by all of us reading or quoting the Lord's Prayer together. So we're going to put that up on the screen. And so I want all of us, let's do it in unison today, to read the Lord's Prayer. If you have your Bibles open and you want to read it there, it's in Matthew chapter 6. And we're going to begin reading in verse 9. But, but let's say this in unison today. So, so, so read this and pray this with me today as a congregation. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And many of us would finish, even though it's not in the text, we would say, and yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's continue praying today. Father, and we do call you our Father today. We reach out to you, and Father, as a church family today, we come recognizing our dependence upon you. We pray for our many families who are out today. Lord, I pray that you would protect them and Lord, give them safety as they travel. I pray for those families in our midst that are moving this summer. And Lord, I know we have families that moved yesterday and other families that are going to be moving out of town and out of state. Lord, I just pray that you would be with them. But Lord, I pray this morning that that you would meet with us in a fresh way. Lord, help us to take a very familiar passage of Scripture and help us to apply it to our lives. Help it not to just be something that we've heard over and over again. But Lord, help us to understand that maybe in a, in a fresh way, in a new way, in a way that will help us and enable us in our prayer lives. And it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. So, so we're studying this summer the prayers of Scripture. And the idea being what to pray, what do we say when we're praying, what do we pray when we don't know what to say. And the premise is that you and I have the ability to take the prayers of Scripture, and those prayers of Scripture are not just the text that they read, but those prayers of Scripture very much so can be a prayer that we rehearse and we pray back to God. As I mentioned, the text that we're studying today is probably, without a doubt, the most famous prayer in all of Scripture. Tim Keller has said, talking about this prayer, that these may be the set of words spoken um, more than any other words in the history of the world. (laughs) So this is a very, very familiar passage of Scripture. And yet I believe that this is an untapped resource for us. If we're not careful, we view it as a liturgical element in the service. We view it as a prayer to be repeated. Maybe you come from a religious tradition in which the Lord's Prayer is said on a regular basis, maybe even every Sunday. Maybe you as a family have repeated this prayer on a regular basis as you meet together, maybe before a meal, or maybe at some other times you have repeated this prayer over and over again. But rarely do we view it as something personal, Something that we can claim. Something that we can apply to our lives. A model or a manner, as it were, that shows us how to pray. So let me just give you a couple of introductory thoughts before we jump into the prayer. And I want to approach it from a little bit of a different angle today. Maybe a new angle and show you something fresh and new. But if you have your outline in front of you, notice several introductory thoughts that Jesus brings out before he actually gets to the Lord's Prayer. The first is this. Jesus tells us that you and I should pray sincerely and not hypocritically. Notice if you have your Bible in front of you, we'll put it up on the screen. In verse 5, Jesus says this, And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. A hypocrite, by the way, during those times was an actor, and they would wear these exaggerated masks, and, and they would act in a certain way in an exaggerated form. And the term hypocrite came to symbolize somebody who pretended to be something that they weren't. So Jesus says when you pray, 
Don't be like the hypocrites. Don't pretend that you're more spiritual than you really are. Notice what he says, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received your reward. I love verse 6, notice it, but when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. What's the idea? The idea is that you have a you have a God to whom you can share the most intimate details of your life. You, You have a God to whom you can share the secrets of your life. He longs to know that. He longs for you and I to be sincere in his presence, to tell him what's bothering us, to tell him what's hurting us. We saw that just a few weeks ago as we studied the Psalms of Lament. And we talked about the fact that you and I can be honest with God. And so the first thing Jesus says is that when you and I pray, we should pray sincerely and not hypocritically. Notice the second thing he says. He said, you should pray conversationally and not ritualistically. And notice how Jesus says that in verse 7. He says, and when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do. For they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them. For your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Here's what Jesus is saying in simple terms. He says, listen, your prayer doesn't have to be eloquent. It doesn't have to be beautiful. You don't have to use these large, eloquent phrases. You don't have to pray in a ritualistic formula. You can pray in a conversational manner with God. Your prayer can be just a conversation between you and God. It's not for show. It's not for anyone else but you and God. Notice what he says there, too. He says in verse 8, he says, or in verse 7, I think he says, um, we're going to hit it in just a few moments, where he, because he talks about that your Father knows what you need before you even ask Him. That's such a great truth. Notice the third point. Let me hit it real quickly. You should pray both individually and congregationally. You say, Brian, where do you see that in the passage? Verse 9, it simply says, pray like this. And some of us would argue, and I think it's seen in the passage, that that the verb that's used there is not a singular verb, it's a plural verb. And so in other words, Jesus is saying, not only should you and I have this individual prayer life that we go into our closet, as he mentions here in the passage, and we spend this intimate time in prayer with God, but there is validity to us as a congregation praying together. To us lifting up our voices and praying together just as we did a few moments ago with the Lord's Prayer when we're going to end the service, praying that prayer together again. I'm afraid, and we talk about this as a team, I think sometimes we spend just way too little time in prayer during the service, and I think there's validity, there's power in God's people coming together and joining hands and praying together. We see that in the passage. So what is it that that Jesus is teaching us? As a matter of fact, this exhortation, this Lord's Prayer, was given in response to the disciples asking the Lord, teach us to pray. You can see that in the parallel gospel in Luke as the disciples looked at Jesus and said, Jesus, teach us to pray. And in response, Jesus gives them this, the Lord's Prayer. So what is it that Jesus is trying to teach us? There's so many things, and I certainly can't exhaust them all today. Let me mention just a couple that I trust will be an encouragement for you today and will help you and me in our prayer lives. The first is this. Jesus is teaching us that prayer connects the eternal with every day. Think that. Think about that. Prayer connects the eternal with the every day. It connects the majesty of God with the mundaneness of our life. It connects the loftiness of God with the lowliness of our everyday existence. It's almost like Jesus is showing us that through prayer, He's reaching down and He wants to touch each and every one of us. The everyday connecting with the eternal. You read through the prayer. It's easy to notice that there are two parts 
If you have your Bible in front of me, notice the, the, that there's two parts. The first part has three petitions. It's found in verses 9 and 10. And the second half has three petitions. It's found in verses 11 through 13. The first three petitions are, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The second three petitions are, give us this day our daily bread, forgive us our debts as we have forgiven those, or we have forgiven our debtors, and then lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Let let me ask you today, can you feel the difference in those two sections? Can you feel that? Can, Can you see that? The first three petitions so show the greatness of God, His holiness, His kingdom, His will, while the second three petitions show our humanness, our need for food, our need for forgiveness, our need for holiness. There's a distinction. There are two completely different parts to this prayer. What does that show? I believe it shows that there is a connection between the content of prayer and the content of our daily lives. Even more so, here's what it it shows, and I really want you to catch this. I know it seems simplistic, but follow me today. God desires to be connected to your everyday life. Do you get that today? God desires to be connected to your and mine everyday life. Life. He's not disinterested. He's not detached. He's not aloof. He's not unconcerned. God is interested in your everyday life and in my everyday life. His desire for His holiness, His will, and His kingdom must be a part of our everyday existence. That's what Jesus is showing us in this prayer. He also, I believe, shows us that there is no difference between the spiritual and the secular. We've talked about that. We want to make the distinction. So so what we do on Sunday is the Lord's Day, and that's the spiritual. But what we do from Monday to Saturday or Monday to Friday, that's my life. That's that's the secular. Here's what Jesus is showing. There's no distinction Jesus doesn't want to be involved in our lives only on Sunday, but Jesus desires to be involved in your life and mine every single day of our lives. He connects the eternal with the every day in our life. There's not a godly part of your life and a worldly part of your life. God sees all of your life, all of my life as one thing. And he desires to connect those two things in our life. So what does that show us? We can pray even about what we think are the simple things of life. We can pray about the struggles that we have at work. We can pray about the conflicts we have with our neighbors. We can pray about the argument that we just had with our spouse. We can pray about the struggles that we have with the relationship with our kids. We can pray about, I got three bills and not enough money to pay all the three bills. How do I do that? Here's what Jesus is saying. He desires to connect with your everyday life and my everyday life. And he does that. We connect with him through prayer. You see, prayer connects the eternal with the every day. Let me show you a second thing today. The second thing is this, if you have your outline in front of you, that God as our Father demonstrates his desire and his ability to meet your needs. I thought this was interesting, that as Jesus taught his disciples to pray, he could have He could have used any name for God that he wanted. So he could have told the disciples, listen, when you pray, here's the way you should start. Omnipotent God. But he didn't say that. He could have said, listen, when you start praying, start this way. Omniscient, all-knowing God. But he didn't say that. He could have said, when you pray, recognize that God is the judge to the judge of all the earth. But he didn't say that. 
He could have recognized the eternity of God and, and he could have said, pray to him as the ancient of days. But he didn't say that. He says, when you and I pray, here's the way we pray. Our Father. What does it demonstrate? It demonstrates the paternity of God. The, God, the, the fact that God desires to have this loving, parental, fatherly relationship with you and me. Jesus choosing to address God as Father demonstrates His ability and His desire to meet the needs of His children. If you're a parent, you get that. How many parents or grandparents do we have all around the auditorium? If you're a parent or grandparent, all right? So, so we get that. So, so we got great kids. You guys know our kids. We got great kids. But I think Vicki and I thought at some point, you know, there's going to come a day when our kids are going to graduate from high school. We're going to have to suffer. We're going to have to put them through college. But eventually there's going to day, become a day where we're going to be able to kind of wipe our hands and we're never going to ever have to help them again. Yeah, you're laughing, right? That doesn't happen, right? How many of you, even with adult kids, have got that phone call where it says, Dad, I need your help with something. Mom and Dad, could you help me with this? And as parents, we don't sit back and say, No way, Jose. I already put you through high school. I put you through college. Now you're on your own. As a parent, what do you want to do? As a parent, you want to, you want to be able to help your kids. As a matter of fact, you, you love it. Maybe not always from the financial point of view, but, but, but you love it when your kids call and say, hey, mom, I got a question. Hey, hey dad, I got a question. Hey, hey, dad, can you give me just a piece of advice? Help me, dad, I got a situation that I don't know how to handle. Listen, those are moments that I cherish as a parent. Why is that? Because I love my kids. Imagine Imagine how much more, in a greater way, God loves us and God desires to be there and to help us. We want to make sure that our kids' needs are met. How much more does God desire to do that in our lives? So I see, as you dissect this prayer, and, and we could dissect it in a variety of ways, and I've read so many messages on this passage of Scripture this week, and you could dissect this prayer in so many different ways, but as we dissect this prayer, we see how God desires to be involved in all of the problems of our life. Let me mention three ways that I believe he alludes to in the prayer. First is this, he can help you with your physical needs. God can help you with your physical needs. That is seen in Jesus' exhortation for, for us to ask for the provision of daily bread. He's not oblivious. He's not uninterested in your needs. He wants to know what your needs are and what my needs are, so much so that He wants you to have the confidence that you can go to Him as your Father and ask Him. As a matter of fact, he alludes to that two other times in this chapter. We mentioned it in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 8. He says this, Your Father knows what you need before you ask. How cool of a thought is that? That we serve this omniscient God who, who even when we go to God in prayer and say, Oh my word, God, I got this bill I can't pay. Or, or Lord, here's this need I have that God's up in heaven and He already knows before you ask. And notice how Jesus addresses him. He says, your father knows what you need before you ask him. Matthew chapter 6, verses 31 and 32. Therefore, don't be anxious saying, what shall we eat? Or what, are we show, or what shall we wear? Or, or where shall we go? For the Gentiles seek after all these things. And your heavenly father knows that you need them so can I ask you today, do you have a need this morning? Do you have a need? What is the need in your life? Don't be afraid to share that with your Father. He cares and He wants to know. Notice the second thing. Not only can He help with your physical needs, but He can help with your relational needs. In, in the passage He says, and pray like this, forgive us our debts as we forgive our 
debtors. Now, those can be financial debts. You might be saying, God, okay, I got this huge college bill that I need you to pay, or I got this car loan that I need to pay, or I'm behind on my mortgage and I'm not sure how to do it. Listen, he gets all of that. But I don't think he's just talking about financial debts in the passage. I don't think he's just saying, if you got this debt that you can't pay, listen, let me help you to pay it. But I think he's also speaking of relational failures. I think he's talking about parental mistakes that we have made. Incorrect actions. Actions and attitudes for which we need to be forgiven. So maybe you're here today. Maybe you're here this morning and you're experiencing serious marital issues. Jesus wants to get involved in that. Maybe you're here today and you have strained relationships with your kids. And you, you would love for that relationship to be restored. Jesus wants to get involved in that. Maybe today you have broken friendships and, and there's someone whom, uh, with whom you used to be close and you're no longer close and that relationship is broken and you would long for that relationship to be restored. Here's what I believe Jesus is telling us in this prayer. That God desires to be involved in each and every one of those situations. He mentions a third thing. He says that God can help you with your spiritual needs as well. So we've talked about this recently, and in September we're going we're gonna to do a series we're calling Brokenness that I think is going to be very transformational for our congregation. But let me ask you today, what is the sin that weighs you down? What, what is the tantalizing trap that so easily hooks you? Your father is concerned about each and every one of those issues. Jesus says when you pray, here's what you pray. Lead us not into temptation. Some modern translations have translated it this way. I think it's the same. Don't let us fall into temptation. Either way, your heavenly Father wants to look out for you. If you're struggling today, here's a great verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13. Paul says this, No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man, but God is faithful and He will not let you to be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation He will also provide a way of escape that you may be able to endure it. What's the idea? God is simply saying this, doesn't matter what temptation you're going through, doesn't matter what you're struggling with, you might feel like you cannot win the victory over it, but God is there, He's with you each and every step of the way, and He will give you an escape. He says, pray, lead me not into temptation. So this morning, are you battling a specific sin? Cry out to your Father. Are you constantly defeated and can't seem to win the victory? Reach out to your heavenly Father. He longs to come alongside of you. And he longs to help you become victorious. So when we pray, our Father, what does that demonstrate? It demonstrates that you have a Father God who cares for you. Let me pause because I think it's important to address this issue today. Sometimes those who have not had a great Father figure in their life struggle with this. So maybe the way that you view a dad is, is an absent dad. Or maybe you had a dad, your experience, who wasn't there, who didn't care for you, who left, or, or, or God forbid, maybe it was abusive. And you sit back and you think, man, this whole father thing is, is confusing and difficult to me. I would say this, that you will never, ever, ever, ever find a more loving, caring, compassionate, constant presence in your life than God the Father. Don't allow, don't allow your negative fatherly experience to affect your relationship with your heavenly father because he is unlike any father you have ever had. And I know many of you have had fantastic dads and we have fantastic dads in our congregation and that's not a slight on any of us. 
He is a much better Father than any of us. And we can trust Him. We can reach out to Him. We can share with Him. Why? Because He deeply cares for us. Let me show you a third truth from this prayer. And I struggled with this one. Let me mention it today. The third truth is this. I believe that the first petition is the heart of the prayer. Now I know there's six different petitions in the prayer. There are three majestic petitions and there are three mundane petitions. There are three requests that magnify God and three requests that, that seem to magnify our humanness and our dependency upon God. But I believe that the first petition is the heart of the prayer. And I say that because I believe we often jump over the first petition. So he says this, our Father in heaven, can you repeat the second line with me? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Now I think we jump over that petition very simply because we might not understand it. Because Jesus uses a word that's not familiar to us. Jesus uses a word that we never use. I'm going to take a chance here, but I think I'm going to be right. So has anybody in the auditorium, other than talking about this passage, used the word hallowed in the last seven days? I mean, has anybody ever said, you know, somebody asked you yesterday, where are you going? I'm going to that hallowed church on the four corner of 441 in Taft. Or, or, or this person that I know is just a great hallowed individual. No. Has anybody used it in the last 30 days? The last year? No. So we read it and what happens? We see a word that we're not familiar with and we have a tendency to jump right over it. And yet Jesus begins the prayer saying, when you pray to your Father, here's what you pray. Hallowed be your name. Now what in, the word does the, what in the world does the word hallowed mean? It means to set apart. It means holy. It means to be sacred. It speaks of something that is to be revered. Something that is to be honored. Something that is to be worshipped. So what in the world does Jesus say should be revered, that should be honored, that should be hallowed. It's His name. He says, when you pray, here's what you say, My Father, holy, sacred, set apart, is Your name. There's something special, there's something unique about that request. It what? It alludes to the character of of God. If we're not careful, it's easy for us to jump over those and, and get to, okay, let's get to the meat of the matter. Give me my daily bread. <laughs> or, or forgive me of where I've failed you. Or lead me not into temptation. And we miss what I believe is the very heart of the prayer. John Piper speaking about this This prayer, the Lord's Prayer, says that the last five requests modify the first request. Or the last five petitions serve the first one. And he would say this, that the purpose of the universe is to hallow, is to honor, to bring glory to God's name. So think through the five petitions with me today. He says, your kingdom come. His kingdom coming does what? It hallows the name of God. Your will be done. Whenever His will is done, is what? what? It elevates God's name. He provides for our daily bread. Why? Because He loves us, yes. But more importantly, so that His name can be hallowed. He forgives us of our sins, certainly not because we deserve it, but because of who He is. And every time our sins are forgiven, He is honored, He is revealed, and He is glorified. He helps us overcome temptation. Why? To hallow His name. 
Man, man, let me say this, church, follow me today. Listen, there is a movement today to minimize the holiness of God. We maximize the love of God, and, and certainly we should. First John chapter 4 and verse 8, God is love. And all of us should love in a way that others see the love of God through us. But if we're not careful, we maximize the love of God and we minimize the holiness of God. And here's what Jesus reminds us. Jesus reminds us that the holiness of God should be our ultimate purpose. So as you wake up in the morning, man, your function, your goal is to what? Is to honor and to revere and to demonstrate the holiness of God through your life and through mine. Let me ask you, do you do that? Not just when you're at church on Sunday morning. But when you're having a conversation with your spouse, when you're with your coworkers at work, when you're driving on the turnpike at 5.30 at night and you want to get home, do you and I demonstrate, do we revere, do we elevate the holy name of God? Listen, follow me today. You and I bear His name. As followers of Jesus Christ, Who are we? We are what? We're Christians. We bear the name of Jesus Christ 24-7. Justin and Mark, our boys would tell you that that I drove this into the ground every time they would leave. If they would go out on a date, if they would go out with friends, if they would go somewhere else, they'd be walking out the door. And right before they walked out the door, I'd say, hey, 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 one word. And they'd look back and they'd say, I know, Dad, testimony, testimony. Watch my testimony. And I would say, listen, I know you get frustrated with me at that, but listen, you are my son. You, na- you bear the name Burkholder, but more importantly, you bear the name of Jesus Christ on you. Man, so much so, I, wouldn't it be great if you could pull out our driver's license? I know the driver's license, it would say Christian Matt Sinelli, or Christian Blake Bernal, or Christian Vicki Burkholder. You and I bear the name of Jesus Christ. And it's our responsibility to hallow His name through our lives, and it ought to be part of our prayer. God, enable me to demonstrate your holiness through my life. Enable me to live in such a way that others see the holiness of God through me. Hallowed be your name. Do not minimize holiness in this day and age. If we're not careful, it's easy for us to excuse sin. It's easy for us, and I'm a huge grace of God guy. I am so thankful for the grace of God. Where would I be? Where would you be if it weren't for the grace of God? But if we're not careful, we can live under the umbrella of grace as if grace were an excuse to allow us to continue to sin. It's not. The Apostle Paul addressed that in Romans chapter 6. He said, man, so if every time I sin, I receive the grace of God, wouldn't it make sense for me to sin continuously so that I might continuously experience the grace of God? And you know what Paul's response was? In the Greek, here's what it was. No way, Jose. That's exactly what Paul said. Paul said, no way, How can you who have been redeemed, who have been forgiven, how can you continue in sin? That's what Jesus says the heart of his prayer. Is our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. I lift up the name of Jesus through my praise. I lift up the name of Jesus through my worship. I lift up the name of Jesus through my actions. I lift up, I honor, I revere the name of Jesus through my lifestyle. God, help me to live in such a way that I hallow your name. Let me show you one final truth. The final truth is this. All of these petitions are fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Let me say that again. All of these petitions are fulfilled in Jesus. That's the truth of the gospel. 
Jesus is the fulfillment of each of these positions. Let me show you a couple of verses. The 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 20, the Apostle Paul makes this statement. He says, For all the promises of God find their yes in Him. They find what? They find their fulfillment in Jesus Christ. That is why it is through Him, through Jesus, that we utter our amen to God for His glory. Why is that? Because all of God's promises, all of God's petitions are fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. And we can take all six of these petitions and we can demonstrate that. Let me show you quickly. Hallowed be your name. Jesus was tempted in every single way, but he was what? He was without sin. So even though you and I struggle with sin, and you and I, man, nobody can ever say, hallowed be the name of David Bennett, even though David Bennett's a fantastic guy. Nobody can ever say, hallowed be the name of Steve Taylor, even though Steve Taylor's a wonderful guy. Why is that? Because we all have struggles, we all have failures, we all blow it at times. But you can't say that about Jesus Christ. He was tempted in every way, yet he was without sin. Your kingdom come. How is that fulfilled in Jesus? He is the coming king. He's the one that initiated the kingdom, and one day he will fully come in power as king at his second coming. He is the king of the kingdom. Your will be done. God's will is perfectly found in the person and in the mission of Jesus Christ. Give us this day our daily bread. He's what? John chapter 10. He is the bread of life. Forgive us our debts. Our forgiveness is only found through Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.21 Jesus became sin for us who knew no sin. That we, through forgiveness, might become what? The righteousness of God. Lead us not into temptation. Overcoming temptation is only possible through the truth of the gospel. You see, Jesus' death not only freed us from the penalty of sin, but Jesus' death and resurrection frees us from the power of sin as well. Paul said it this way in Romans chapter 6 and verse 6, we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. Here's what I'm saying. All of the requests of the Lord's Prayer point to Jesus. I had a conversation with a gentleman today and I agree 100%. We were talking and he said, Brian, do you know that every book in the Bible points to Jesus? I'm like, absolutely, amen. From Genesis to Revelation, the Bible is about whom? It is about Jesus. He is the fulfillment of all of Scripture. So when Jesus says, man, here's the way you pray, And he gives us this great, this this model in prayer. He's pointing us to whom? He's pointing us to himself. And he's saying, I am the one who enables you. I am the one who helps you. I am the one who connects with you. I am the one who connects the eternal with the everyday of our lives. Let me say this in just a, a real practical way. And we'll be done today. It's the walk away point in your outline today. If you want to look at it, it's this. When we lose our grip on the greatness of God, when we lose our grip on the holiness of his name, and when we lose our grip on the complete fulfillment of Jesus and all of these aspects, we're more easily overwhelmed by the problems of life. Does that make sense today? Does that make sense? Can I read it again? All right, I I want that to sink in. When we lose our grip on the greatness of God, when we lose our grip on the holiness of His name, when we lose our grip on the fulfillment of Jesus in every single one of those petitions in our our lives, it is is easier for us to become overwhelmed by the problems of life. So what happens? Here's what happens. Here's what happens. And it happens to me, and and I bet it happens to you. We take our eyes off Jesus. We take our eyes off Jesus. We look at the problems. We look at the people who've offended us. 
We look at a spouse who has hurt us. We look at a, a, at a job that we lost. We look at the problems of our life, and at that moment, the problems of our life become bigger, they become greater than Jesus. And we take our eyes off of Him, and because of that, at that moment, we're overwhelmed by the problems. If we're not careful, then it leads us in the wrong direction very simply. Why? Because we've taken our eyes off of Jesus. You see, it's so simple. It's so simple, but it's profound. Even as we meet to pray on Sunday mornings, one of our prayers, we have two prayers as we meet to pray on Sunday morning, that Jesus' name would be honored and glorified through all that's done, and that secondly, we simply would point people to Jesus. You see, our task is very simple. It's, it's complicated in, in that we have the, the, the huge responsibility of taking the Word of God and explaining it and, 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 and trying to make it relevant. But it's really simple in the fact that my job, very simply, is to point you to Jesus. So I have no idea what you're going through today. You might be here and you might be hurt. Jesus is the answer to your hurt. You might be here today and you're angry. Jesus is the answer to your anger. You might be here and you might be confused today. Jesus is the answer to your confusion. Take your eyes off of the overwhelming problems of life and fix your gaze on Jesus. So can we pray the Lord's Prayer together? We can put that back up on the screen, please, Evan. Let's pray the Lord's Prayer together today, not just individually, but let's pray it congregationally. Are you ready? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So let me ask you today, how does that prayer apply to you? Maybe you're here today and you desperately need forgiveness. The truth of the gospel is to you. And I'd encourage you to come. We'll have some of our leaders down front and we'd love nothing more than to show you from God's word how you can know for sure that you have been forgiven. Maybe it's other aspects. Maybe you have a need today, a relational need, a physical need. Man, let me encourage you. Come to Jesus. He is the answer for whatever problem you and I may have. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for the Lord's prayer. Lord, I know it's something that's so common to us. Father, we know it by heart. We've quoted it. But Father, help us to understand the heart behind it. Help us to realize that we have a loving Father who cares for us, who wants the best for us, who is sovereign, who is behind the scenes, that is manipulating not only the good things that happen in our lives, but the bad things that happen in our lives to point us in the, dire the direction He desires for us to go. And I pray that you would help us to trust in Him. I pray if there's a person here today that is never that has never confessed their sin, that has never by faith reached out to Jesus Christ, that today in their heart they would make that decision. Lord, for, for those of us here today who have taken our focus off Jesus and are looking at other things, help us, Lord, to, to fix our gaze back on Jesus today. Lord, I pray that you would do a work in our hearts that only you can do. And it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.